Um, hi everyone, welcome to the lecture six for our Gridspace IEP series. Uh, my name is Phoebe Piercy. I um, was at MIT, I was class of 2020, and I realized today that this is, I think, the sixth year in a row that I have taught something over an IAP. Um, definitely not what I thought I would continue past MIT, so glad to be here. Um, so today's lecture is for tools for LLM perception. So first of all, I'm going to just go over the exercises that Jeremy gave uh, on Monday for perception as a, as a topic. Um, so what are some aspects of NLP that is human-like? What are aspects that aren't? Similarity might be semantic and context understanding. Differences might include limited world knowledge, lack of common sense, um, although that's not necessarily different. Um, how do humans combine different sensory information? How do ML models do so? Humans, cross-modal pathways and regions, superior colliculus, temporal and spatial coincidence, models, multimodal models, transfer learning, feature fusion. Um, and we're going to talk a bit more about that today. So just to uh, ground us in where we are in the series, uh, the first week was planning, the second week was memory, this week is perception, next week is going to be language and symbolic reasoning. So this is where we are. Um, and today's roadmap, we're going to briefly go over um, perception and remind us on Jeremy's uh, definitions. And we're going to go through a few different approaches to how we might equip an LLM to perceive the world. Um, brief detour into state tracking and then some exercises. So perception. To recap Jeremy's definition, um, we ended up with the organization, identification and interpretation of sensory information. So in order to further break this down such that we can use this in a tool, we need to define these different points. So first of all, let's define what we mean by sensory information. Um, I would like everyone to just close your eyes for a second and imagine what comes to mind when I say the word blue. You're not closing your eyes. I can see your eyes. I perceive your eyes. Um, when you think the word blue, um, what your brain is doing is it actually activates the parts of your brain that get activated when you see the color blue, when um, your visual cortex feeds that information through your brain. So your internal representation of the word blue is um, something abstract. It's not in words. An LLM, on the other hand, uh, it knows the word blue enough to use it, but it knows it in the context of like the sky is blue, the sea is blue, Blue lies between green and purple. Um, yes, it does. Um, it has more of a semantic basis for the word blue that then, once it's encoded, it then does have its own embedding space that the word blue would map to. But that's not going to be, it doesn't have the same basis as our interpretation of blue that tends to come from um, our visual cortex. So it's a different interpretation of the way we perceive Blue. Um, so with that in mind, let's kind of give our LLM some eyes and some ears um, and define the sensory inputs. So we're going to focus on eyes and ears today, but in general, sight and sound, we might have an analogy to this as like cameras, light sensors, microphones. These are the things that we use to measure these sensors. Um, smell and taste, chemical spectrometers, um, Less of an area of research in how to equip LLMs with smell and taste, um, but I don't know, I kind of want to see a wine tasting robot. Um, touch might be haptic feedback. And then you have the slightly more um, edge perceptions that are actually very important, especially for something like a robot. So like vestibular sensation, where you are in space, what your balance is. So we use our, the tiny bones in our ears. Um, a phone uses an accelerometer, geomagnetic sensors, and where you are in relation to other objects. Proprioception, so how you yourself are positioned, like am I, my bones doing certain things? Um, motor speed, these are all things that robots do. Like if we're programming a robot, these are things that you need to know, but they don't often go through an LLM, right? You don't translate that into language and then back into like, the voltage amounts that you need to control these things. Um, but these are some sensory inputs that we might want to equip an LLM with. 
Um, so then on the kind of spectrum from a sensory input all the way to a perception. So a sensory input is not by itself a perception. Um, it can be, but it can also just be uh, like the start of the process. So raw samples, we might then move on to like feature extraction and processing. Um, for an audio sample, then our brains might translate that into text. Um, and you don't remember then all the text that gets said. When you imagine a conversation you had, you're not like memorizing every single word of someone might be, but usually you've then already translated that a step further into a perceived meaning, um, some inference and emotion, a topic, something more of a, of a contextual perception of what that conversation was about. Um, so just keep this in mind as we go through some of the rest of the talk. Cool. Uh, any questions before we just get started on some different approaches that we might take? Great. Um, so approach one, I'm calling description, and it's going to seem pretty basic. So let's imagine inside out the film. And you're the people inside the brain who are responsible for doing all the talking. Um, you're also responsible for controlling the person. But you have blackout blinds. Um, you cannot see or hear anything. And all you get is postcards, like a little postcard delivered to you. And that has all the information that you're allowed to use. So initially, uh, if you just ask for a response from an LLM without any contextual information from the environment, um, it's going to be like, tell me more. So a basic idea might be we provide sound by describing a conversation. So my mother said, I have to wash the dishes, write a response. Thanks for letting me know. I'll take care of the dishes as soon as I can. This is, in its essence, a perception. We are equipping the LLM with sound. We have done all of the hard work, essentially, as far as like taking the sensory input into perception. And we are just delivering to the LLM, this is what I have, uh, this is the world you live in, go. Um, we can also use this to augment this. We can provide tone, my mother said an angry tone, and the LLM can take this and respond. We have essentially equipped it with tonal perception. Um, provide sight, the dishes already look clean, write a response. Hey mom, notice the dishes are already clean, happy to help with any other chores. I'd like to say ChatGPT is very useful, it would make the ideal child. Um, I've done a lot of asking it to wash the dishes and it always agrees. It has yet to like <laughs> say no. Um, we can also push this to the extremes. So then let's imagine that we want to give it all the context that we have humans have access to. So my mother said I have to wash the dishes. I feel tired. She looks upset. Huge piles of dishes. The kitchen smells of curry. And a lot of this is irrelevant information. Um, the LLM will still quite often try to respond to all of it. It doesn't do a good job necessarily with um, a descriptive context of separating, it, separating out useful and not useful information. Um, so to me, in this thing, the two key points is that she's upset and I'm tired. Um, I don't really care that the kitchen smells like curry, um, but... It does do a reasonably good job of adding, of attending to those two things, but it does try to use all the information you've, you've given it. So, okay, step back. What are we actually doing here? We're providing natural language that describes what the LLM should be able to perceive. This gives us control over all aspects of the perception because we are doing the perception. We're just telling the LLM what, what it has. Um, it plays to LLM strengths because they are trained on huge corpuses of descriptive text. Um, the cons is labor heavy. It's entirely manual from a human point of view. Um, it relies on our ability to describe in words and that's not that good often unless you're like a descriptive writer, I suppose, or just very good at it. Um, it's awful overly verbose, unstructured, very sensitive to prompt changes. It's hard to engineer around. This isn't a good engineering solution to providing um, perception. So that brings me to approach number two, which is very similar. Just we are structuring, formalizing, and categorizing the perceptions that we allow our LLM to have access to. And I'm calling this annotation. 
Um, so this might look like you, if we're sticking with dialogue and as a voice bot company, we uh, do a lot of the, the dialogue thing. Um, this might involve annotating the dialogue with things that you uh, want the model to have access to, perceptions. Again, this is exactly the same kind of thing of we're doing the perception. Uh, we're just writing it in. So this kind of allows us to formalize and categorize it. It gives us more control over groupings of perceptions. It allows us to control if the LLM does attend to those or not. Um, it is possible to engineer around because you can uh, add in these, it, you don't have to formulate a sentence, you're adding in what is essentially a token. So you can kind of write around it. It still relies on human interpretation. Um, it's inflexible. The perception is still upstream. We are still just describing to the LLM what it should perceive. So number three is basically taking us out of the equation. So, so far it's been signal in, human translate to natural language into LLM. So now next step would be taking the human out. This is kind of similar to the annotation, but we're now using models to um, get to that. Essentially using models to provide those annotations. So this might take the form of an emotion model, um, which categorizes and it does the heavy lifting of the perception based on feature extraction and categorization. Again, we have a lot of control over this and we can make each specialized model that we're using to do the perception um, very task oriented. But it means that those models don't also have access to the huge semantic me uh, meandering world that the LLM has been trained on. So you're kind of uh, limiting how much work the LLM is doing. And when the LLM is the most powerful part of your pipeline, it can potentially um, limit the, the kind of success there. Um, another kind of way of doing this is actually letting the LLM decide what it wants to attend to, because we would still have the issue of uh, the human having to decide which parts of the world get attended to. Um, so there was this paper that came out called Chat with the Environment um, at the end of last year. And they were basically trying to use a train a robot to um, navigate its environment, but using an LLM as its entire control system. Um, so the way they were doing this was they had uh, this series of um, what they called multimodal perception models, modules. And the LLM would uh, essentially ask for res a response from them. A bit like uh, when Monkin was talking about tool retrieval, but in this case, the tools is a model that uh, can like perceive the environment. Um, so the way this might look is that they say, pick, uh, to read, but pick up the glass box and they have three blocks. So the LLM would ask, okay, pick up a block and I need to know its weight. The weight module would weigh it and comes back with a natural language sentence. So it's all, again, all of the communications between the models are done with natural language. Um, it weighs light, the robot asks again. Um, another one weighs heavier, asks again, knock on it, it sounds tinkling. Okay, it must be glass. So. Now in our pipeline from sensory input through to perception, this is actually a lot more towards, now that LLM is doing some of the perception, it has to work out what it needs. The module just come back with like the answer essentially, and the LLM is still responsible for, okay, is that the information I need to draw the conclusion that this is glass or not? Um, so again, what are we actually doing here? So this is essentially using specialized models to translate sensory information into natural language that describes what the LLM might be able to perceive. Um, not vastly different from our first one, except for now models are doing all the heavy lifting. Easier to use, less manual, some control over the perception models and their outputs, but more flexibility is given to the LLM to make decisions about what it's going to perceive. Um, cons are, Potential loss of information, 
especially when all these models are translating into and out of natural language, which is a pretty low, um, low dimensional space, um, you might lose a lot of information. So like a picture versus a description of a picture is going to be um, a lot lower information than just the picture itself, right? So there's loss of information, compounding misinformation possibly happens all the time with humans. Um, it's like humans talking to each other. And perception is still mostly external to the LLM itself. So this brings me through to approach four, um, multimodal token input. And this is the only one I would say that actually puts, uh, leaves perception to the LLM itself, as opposed to having tooling scenarios that allow us to describe perceptions to the LLM. Um, so, like I say, a picture says a thousand words. So this was attributed to Fred Barnard in 1921. I don't know if that's true. I feel like this sentence is one of those where who knows who said it first. Um, but I say, therefore, it takes a thousand words to describe a picture. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, OK, moving back to our analogy of inside out. So far, we have been delivering postcards to our people inside the brain. And uh, the people get to read those and decide what to do. But wouldn't it be better if uh, we could deliver a picture and have it just infer from that picture what we want it to mean? Um, so I'm flipping backwards and forwards from vision and audio a bit. As far as signals goes, it's uh, mm -hmm. the, Two dimensional versus one dimensional, there's differences in how we would use them and how we want, like the features we want to interpret. But for the sake of inputs and outputs, um, we can we can flip between the two. Um, so let's say this is what we've looked at so far. We have a signal input, we have let's say an automatic speech recognition system. Uh, blows it out into its internal representation of the audio and then decodes it into natural language, um, which then gets fed to the LLM. So this part is kind of, it's a funnel that reduces the dimensional space, loses information, and uh, what if we could just take that out? So one paper that came out, um, that's a sentence, one paper that came out, it is actually this paper, I promise, um, basically proposed using an audio encoder, but then instead of uh, using natural language as the, as the inside, um, doing a projection layer in between the two to translate the internal representation of the audio embeddings into the uh, kind of embedded space that the LLM can interpret without going through natural language. So. This paper was called Prompting Large Language Models with Speech Recognition Abilities. Um, the really cool thing about it is that they actually found that it was able to do this uh, without any fine tuning of the language model itself, um, given that the projection layer was correctly trained. Um, so they, their kind of methodology was to embed the audio and then just put it right next to the text as input. And the text was uh, then asked to generate the next token, given the audio in. Uh, one disadvantage to this is just like the the context space that like any kind of higher dimensional signal requires. Um, so they experimented with a bunch of different um, different ways to distill the the dimensions in the audio without losing so much information that it wasn't able to uh, correctly infer the next word, um, but whilst keeping it as efficient as possible, um, as far as contact space goes. So this is pretty cool. Uh, so in this situation, we have given the audio in its entirety to the LLM, um, but we are only asking it to do one task. And we are still relying on the LLM to have to be mapping the audio to the same space as its text. The, the LLM is still only trained on text. 
we are simply adding a modality that um, maps to the same space, right? Um, here are just some examples of, of encoders we might use for this. So audio could be like conformers or wave to vec two. Um, vision bit, uh, vision transformer. I thought Flamingo was cool because it, it makes use of uh, what they called a perceiver resampler, whereby they essentially used iterative attention to work out which parts of the vision visual input were significant um, and to pay attention to so that you can then actually then optimize your uh, context inputs so that you're not giving it a bunch of unnecessary information and wasting context space. Um, quick pause, any uh, questions so far? Yes. Sorry? Um, so they're generally like, I know the submit was trained on like um, captioned image caption pairs. Um, so it's, they're mostly trained to just uh, input, take as input the sensory data and transform it to the same, to, to some embedding space that they can also, uh, that the text can also be Im embedded in. Um, yeah, does that, uh, which does also have its drawbacks in terms of the ability of the LLM to actually do visual inference or audio inference because it is entirely kind of uh, still semantically trained, right? How does the transformer know that the difference between, say, which one is audio, which one is text, is there a um, you mean in this paper? Yeah. Uh, yes, there's there's a, a beginning of sentence token for the for the text. They delimit like, yeah, with the token. Here is the audio. Here is the. Um, where does clip fit into the stuff on the next slide? Um, clip is remind me. Uh, I mean, I just know that clip is what's behind Dolly. I think Dolly. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's something like this, but I don't understand. It's um text to text to image decoding. It's, it's, uh, um, I guess it can be used. Yeah, yeah, text. To it, it's just a comparison. I mean, I think I've heard that it performs better on image segmentation, semantic segmentation, but it's also all. Uh, I'm sure people bench people love the benchmarking. Um. I'm realizing I didn't repeat any of the questions out loud for people on the video. I will do that from now on. Sorry. Um, cool. So my final kind of approach is actually, this is cool, but it's still two models that are completely separately trained and we're just training a layer in between. Like this is still the equivalent of a natural language, but it's just higher dimensional. So what if we just like did that? Um, and this is, kind of the state of the art at the minute. So Gemini, um, I love this image. I think it's quite funny, um, but also very evocative. Like, I love it. Um, they're essentially taking the input sequence and they're directly embedding it and having that as the input to the transformer and it is trained on that. So it's not assumed that the multimodalities are going to have the same embedding space as the text. They are allowed to, the the, LLM is allowed to um, have its internal representations of the image, the text, the video, in whichever way it sees fit. So this is, I'd say, the most approximating, like, um, human, the way humans perceive things, right? We have sensory input that just feeds everything to the brain, and the brain is responsible for whatever internal representation it has of those inputs. Um, so I played around with Bard with my washing dishes analogy and when asked like please wash the dishes but I fed it an image of a clean kitchen it successfully said there are no dirty dishes in the image so it's difficult to provide neckline in the dialogue. Um, I really like this it's like the very first example was me as a human perceiving there was no dirty dishes and describing that to the LLM and this is showing that that same level of perception happened within the LLM itself. Um, 
So that's quite cool. However, there are, were like, when asked to just describe the image, it, it got a couple things wrong um, and it was very overly verbose in it. I'd say it re repeated itself a lot. And I think this perhaps is down to the fact that LLMs are still mostly strong on language, right? Um, their image, uh, their image data is less than than their text data, um, and this was an interesting one to me in that I asked it and it kind of gave a bad answer, um, or it just said it could wash the dishes. So I asked it again and it said it couldn't see the image. So it turns out Gemini doesn't probably for context length reasons doesn't actually replicate the image in every new chat you see. So then I gave it the kitchen again. And I was like, here's the kitchen. Do you see dirty dishes? Um, first of all, it told me, it hallucinated. It just told me that I can't see the image. And then, um, yeah. Um, but then it said, based on the description you provided, the kitchen you described does not contain dirty dishes. You mentioned that it has a stove and a sink, but you did not mention anything about food or drink residue or dirty dishes. I would like to mention that I never described the kitchen. I literally just said, please wash the dishes, here's an image. I never once described the kitchen. So I, my interpretation of this is that um, Gemini is essentially creating a, an image action for, for continued dialogue. I have not thoroughly tested this, um, but again, it's doing the thing of distilling an image into um, description and it loses a lot of the necessary information. So like it's inferring that from the fact that I didn't mention dirty dishes that there are no dirty dishes, but um, because of it doesn't have the context along with the image, it wasn't necessarily able to maintain exactly what it should be paying attention to, like a human would. Does that uh, does that make sense? I don't know if I'm describing this particularly well. Um, anyway, cool. So back to the what are we doing? What are we actually doing here? We're providing input embeddings that describe directly um, the, and this isn't actually what the LLM should be able to perceive. It describes directly the sensory input. Um, it's more detailed, less manual. You can just like feed it the whole thing and hope it like does well. But that also means that it's less directed. You get less control over what it pays attention to. Um, you just kind of trust that it is able to attend to the correct parts of the input. Um, it requires a very large input context, like audio by itself is, but then you move to visual, that's like 2D. If you add video, that's like time dimension as well. Um, also, LLMs tend to be undertrained on like multimodal data as compared to their natural language. So it doesn't play quite so well to the strengths of the model. Um, and just a final kind of note on multiple modalities um, that occur at once. There's, I feel like this is something that maybe is going to be further developed in the next year, but um, there was a bunch of kind of image to sound like joint embedding space research before, like I feel like that was kind of going off a couple of years ago. Um, and then LLMs kind of took the focus for the majority of last year, but marrying together like text, but also vision and audio. Um, humans, right, use uh, the combination of the two to make out text. So when we're doing automatic speech recognition, we rely purely on the audio, but that's not how a human does it. A human doesn't differentiate necessarily between what inputs it's using to, to infer certain textual features um, if it's using vision or audio. Um, so that's just kind of an area of research that I think is underdeveloped right now. Yes. Um, I'm not going to lie, this is from Reddit. Um, I'm, I mostly liked the way the diagrams with the embedding space were, but um, I think what it is doing is so. Intermodality is like between the two different modalities, so between video and text. So that goes from like the squares to the circles. Intramodality is like within the same modality. I think they're just like showing where the cosine similarity might be um, roughly the same. Um, yeah.
Um, cool. So just to briefly recap the approaches we've got over. Um, the first two could be grouped roughly into like human translation of sensory information. Um, approach two and three can be grouped into model translation of sensory information. And then the last one is multimodal inputs directly to the LLM. Um, and then to kind of put this on our graph of, of sensory input through to perception, um, a lot of the earlier methods relied on humans to interpret the, the perceived output. Um, but the description annotation and NL inputs really could be at any point on this, except for, I guess, yeah, it kind of could be at any point on this, but raw samples in, um, at that end, it's really only multimodal models that that happens with. I personally found annotation actually provided the best results. Um, that gave me the most reliable outputs as far as I was able to do, like more concretely know what to expect. Um, but that just comes from it being a high level of, of manual control. Um, cool. Any questions? Did you train this like uh, Gemini style transformer? Like, I guess I can see how it's natural to pre train an LLM. Like, you just sequentially like be in all this internet like language. But, like, how do you sort of get the pre training mix for a multimodal uh, transformer? In what sense? As in, like, like, how you how do you you know set up the pre-training data? Like, do you how do you put you put the like YouTube video next to the caption? Like, what do you do? I I think that so my understanding is it was trained on like text. Or it was trained specifically on image caption pairs as well. So that was one of the training inputs. Then the last one was just a a general crawl of the internet for all media. So I imagine at that point they're just relying on the sheer amount of data and they're just they're not relying on pairs they're not captioning it necessarily they're just formatting the whole page into the stream embeddings um was my like interpretation of of, of that description of, of the part but yeah they did have image caption pairing which i imagine then helps i guess when it's just getting a stream of consciousness stream of web consciousness um Anything else? Sorry, that question was, um, how does the Gemini uh, format its multimodal training, uh, the multiple modalities in its training data? Cool. So just a brief foray um, into state tracking because so far all of the multimodal inputs have been like singular time uh, points in time, we feed it an audio clip we feed it an image, um, we feed it a video. Even that, even though it does have, you know, time is in a video, it's still in its essence, one piece of media at one point in time. And a lot of human perception relies on our ability to um, track changes and state changes and keep our own internal representations of what, um, what, what, what the world is. So um, this also relies on like, the memory aspects so recall nick and lookman's lectures on the memory um this might require further augmentation but imagine like my response to a situation might be determined on how hungry i am that's an internal state that's a, a perception that i have of my needs and what i what i feel in the world um i live for you um <laughs> This is knowable, but we do, it does then require extra, everything we've looked at so far doesn't have that ability to track state internally, intrinsically, that it would be an extra um, perception augmentation. Um, so while sensory snapshots are useful to truly mimic human perception, we need to incorporate and recall internal perception of state. Um, I'm not gonna go too far into that. That's just, um, there's a couple questions of that on the exercises. Um, yeah, so that pretty early, uh, it's amazing how fast you speak when you're actually up on a stage. Um, so that kind of concludes most of my content. Um, you should watch Inside Out if you haven't. It's great. Um, 
these are the exercises. I'm just going to read through them and then we can move to more of a discussion as well. Um, and I've got references at the end. Uh, how would you imagine giving LLMs access to senses other than sight and sound? So we predominantly spoke sight and sound, but let's say touch, smell, taste. Um, would the encodings differ? How might you augment it? Um, how might you distill signal embeddings such that you reduce the noise, you ensure your model attends to the most informative parts of the signal? So is this through, um, yeah, I'm not gonna answer it. Um, current multimodal models operate mostly on still images and audio. Um, like we were speaking, you, it's a snapshot. This loses information that humans gain from previous contexts and time variants. Can you think of an example of this and how might you address this weakness or um, yeah. Um, that concludes material that people have questions. When people imagine blue, do they imagine a deeper shade? Like, like what was people's shade of blue, right? Royal. Royal? That's very specific. There is a picture. Of, yeah, so that's what I pictured. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, that's what I pictured. Yeah. Um, cool. Otherwise, we'll wrap that early. Hello, thank you for calling Grid Spaces YouTube channel. Did you make sure they liked the video and smash that subscribe button? Yes, I did. And ask them to leave any questions or thoughts in the comments. It helps me a ton. Thank you for watching. And if you'd like to talk to me yourself, go to gridspace.com and click on any one of our demos. Thank you and talk to you soon. Thank you, Grace.